Hello and welcome to another episode of Time About the Movies Flashback. We're looking at the films of January 22nd, 1988. And admittingly, I probably should have done this last week. I was literally going to do this episode last week, but um, I just kind of forgot about it. I have no real excuses except I completely forgot to do it. And um, this isn't even that good of a week anyway. I've not seen any of the six movies that we have here, but um, I don't know. I don't know why I didn't do it. Uh, uh, stupidity on my part, we'll just call it that, but, um, we can get through these pretty quickly, because like I said, we haven't, we ha I haven't seen mo all these movies, so, um, yeah, let's go ahead and get through this pretty quickly, because we're at that point there, this is, a, this is January, this is usually the dumping month where there's not usually that many good movies, and, um, but this was the biggest new release of the weekend, and that is Chuck Norris in Braddock, Missing in Action 3. Chuck Norris is on his way rescue the orphans of a forgotten war. Don't step on any toes. I don't step on toes. I step on necks. James Braddock is fighting for everyone who can't fight back. Chuck Norris. Braddock, missing in action three. Rated R. Starts Friday at a theater or drive-in near you. I've never seen the other Missing in Action movies, so I can't really say how how this fares compared to the other movies, but they were big hits for canon films, and uh, they were in desperation mode, and they needed the film to really kind of save their studio, and um, while this one was, for, I mean, this one was really low-budgeted, but even then it didn't make much of its money back in general, but um, Braddock Missing in Action 3, I'm trying to see if I can find the plot here for this for you. Uh, you have uh, Chuck Norris as Colonel James Braddock, who has a Vietnamese wife who was supposed to leave Vietnam with him when they evacuated. But she loses her papers and wasn't allowed in the embassy, so Braddock went looking for her, and her friend took the bracelet Braddock gave his wife, and, his w and was in an explosion. When Braddock finds the body with bracelets, he assumes that it's his wife, so he leaves Vietnam. Twelve years later, a reverend in Vietnam who was visiting the States approaches Braddock, telling him that his wife is alive and that he has a son. Braddock doesn't believe him at first, but when a man at the CIA asks him to meet with him, Braddock realizes it's true, so he tries to get them out. So he contacts a friend in Thailand to get what he needs as they're about to leave. The CIA tries to stop him, but Braddock gets away, gets his equipment, and heads to Vietnam. And uh, I think you can pretty much see where this goes from there. I mean, this is a long synopsis on it here, but, um, but yeah, like I said, I haven't seen any of these movies. I don't really have... I've never really seen a lot of um, canon films, to be honest with you, but um, yeah, this is one of those ones where... I know it exists. I know Chuck Norris was in it. And Chuck Norris movies were Chuck Norris made canon films stay relevant for much of the '80s, pretty much, because all of his him and Charles Bronson had a lot of movies that made money for them. But like I said, this is one of those ones where they were hoping that this was going to be a profitable hit for them because they were in desperate need for a hit, and then it really bombed at the box office. It, how do you bomb? Make, how do you bomb making only seven million of a nine million dollar budget? Is beyond me, but um. It also didn't help that this is one of those movies that was very troubled. In fact, there was actually four military and police officers killed when they had a helicopter crashed on here. And there was actually another one in the second film, Death in uh, Delta Force Two, uh, the Col the Colombian Connection. Which um, keep in mind, this was after the Twilight Zone in uh, incident where they had a helicopter crash that killed Vic Morrow and two kids. And it was not the it was not the first time, nor would be the last time, apparently, that, that something like this would happen. So. Um, yeah, I'm just kind of filling time here, because like I said, I haven't seen this movie, so I can't really say if it's any good or not, but, um, I don't know. Considering that the first two films were probably more, were more successful, I'm assuming those ones were much better films, but, um, like I said, I really don't know for certain, because I've never seen this film, so. Anyway, let's keep going. Uh, next movie, Five Corners. <laughs> Pretty impressive people behind the scenes. You've got the director, Tony Bill, who did uh, our My Bodyguard. You also got John Patrick Shanley, who did, of course, Joe vs. the Volcano. And then would later, win, and uh, I think around the same time, he won an Oscar for... This is after Moonstruck came out, so he won an Oscar for writing that. But you also have Jodie Foster, Tim Robbins, John Turturro, uh, Todd Graff. Uh, the story here is that you depict 48 hours in the lives of a group of four young New Yorkers in the 1960s. And... Um, it's one of those movies that's been considered that's considered as somewhat of a pro public domain movie, but it's actually a film under the Paragon Entertainment Corporation. Um, handmade Films made it. It's really all I got for you. I wish I had more to tell you, but I haven't seen any of these movies, so I can't really say too much more than I got right here. So um, it came out this weekend. 
And uh, that's pretty much all I got for you on that one, five corners. So uh, this is going to be a very quick episode, if you haven't figured out already. So let's go ahead and move on to the next movie. We'll be Goldberg, starring in the telephone. Hello? What are you wearing right now? Is it boxers or jack? Well, no, I mean, don't, look, don't lie to me. Because I can see you. When I moved in here, this woman wasn't like crazy like this, but she's doing all these drugs. Drugs? I told Lexus drugs. We sure it's not you that's on drugs, Whoopi, because you seem very chaotic in this. Um, yeah, this was right after she did The Color Purple, too, and this is one of those movies where, you know, Color Purple, Jumpin' Jack Flash, um, what was the other one? Uh, Burglar. Uh, there was another one, too. I can't remember what it was, but, yeah, this is a Whoopi Goldberg movie that you've probably never heard of, directed by Rip Torn from Men in Black, and, uh, features Elliot Gould and John Hurd, and it stars Goldberg as an out-of-work actress who makes some prank phone calls, which creates a chain of events. That's literally the movie. In fact, this movie did not do so well to the point where they screened it in New York and then you heard audiences crying out, I want my money back and I hope the film breaks. And the film did eventually become a box office flop and the film really, really was a massive misfire. And it was a movie where Whoopi Goldberg had pretty much f approval over the film's final cut and they pursued it. The producers pursued it her persuaded her to ignore the film's script and improvise, which actually led to arguments with Rip Torn, and he wanted to direct the film as a scripted movie, and he's never directed a film since then, and I really don't know what they were thinking about with this film. I mean, it was a movie where, like, just the idea of it sounds really, really weird in general, and it's just, it just doesn't deliver on what they probably were thinking that this was going to do, and... I don't know, it's just a weird idea in general for a film that seems like a one-note premise, and one that would probably be used for more of a comedy series on NBC at the time, but not a movie like this, but it's a film that feels like they were trying to cash in on Whoopi Goldberg's stardom, and it just it just backfired big time for her, and it's one of those movies that's been largely forgotten, and for good reason, because it looks like a film that really is not all that funny or all that intriguing whatsoever, so, so let's go ahead and move on to the next movie, and that is Promised Land. Since they left the quiet town of Asheville, Utah. Two years can be a long time. Taking me home? For Keeper Sutherland. Some people, they just seem to know exactly where they're going. Meg Ryan. Get out here! Tracy Pollard. Wish I didn't have to grow up. And Jason Gedrick. Thank you. The road ahead seems to lead back home. Oh, Life on the edge of the American dream. Rated. Now playing at selected theaters opens everywhere February 5th. Why did he say it like that? It opens everywhere, February 5th. Like, uh, you already got the job, dude. I mean, just saying. But, like, you don't really need to go, you don't really need to go down that route. But um, this is Promised Land. It's a gritty drama that follows two high school acquaintances, Hancock, a basketball star, and Danny, a geek-turned-drifter, after they graduate. The first film, commissioned by the Sundance Film Festival, it portrays the other half of the American dream. This is, of course, around the time during the Reagan administration. As Hancock and his cheerleader girlfriend Mary want to enjoy middle, middle, a middle-class mediocrity out itself out of reach for Danny and his psychotic wife, Belle. And I, did not, I did not screw that up, though. That's how it's literally said on the look at that. It's want to, wander to a middle-class mediocrity out itself, out of reach for Danny and his psychotic wife. So yeah, I didn't screw that up there. They screwed that up there. And that's why sometimes you got to look at these to probably read these first before you really have to look at this and go like, wait, is that really what they're saying here? But but yeah, this is directed by Michael Hoffman, who's made some pretty good movies. Soap Dish, Re Restoration, uh, One Fine Dr Day, The Emperor's Club. He made stuff like The Emperor's Club, Some Girls. So we've talked about some of his movies on this show and also on Time About the Movies. Um, it's got a good cast overall, Kiefer Sutherland, Meg Ryan, Tracy Pollan, um, but, um, the views for this seem to be pretty mixed in general, and for Meg, and Meg Ryan seemed like she got out of this pretty much with most of the praise in general here, because she got a lot of acclaim for this role, and, um, notable for being one of the first films commissioned by the Sundance Film Festival, but, um, yeah, that's really all I got for you on this one here, but, uh, like I said, I haven't seen it, so... I can't really say how good this movie is, so on to the next movie, and that is The Family.
clearly an Italian film, as you can see. This is an Italian drama film about the intricate lives and relationships of Carlo and his family over decades, navigating through love, jealousy, political upheavals, and personal growth against the backdrop of historical events like World Wars One and Two. Um, that's uh, again really all I got for you on this one here. It was submitted for the Oscars for Best Foreign Language Film, but did not win. But uh, this director, Itor Scola, who has done, let's see what he's done here. A lot of different Italian films that I really do not know about because I've not seen much of his movies after the, much of his movies in general. So again, not really giving you a whole lot there. So um, <laughs> uh, yeah, this is not one. This is not going to be one of the better episodes here. But uh, let's go ahead and move on to our last movie here, and that is King Lear. I mean. I mean, the movie is called King Lear. It can't be that ridiculously over the top, can it? Am I in France? In your own kingdom, sir. And now, do not let me change your kingdom. <laughs> What the hell is this? I'm crying out loud, somebody throw a pie! What Peter said, I mean, what the hell was that? Um, yeah, this is not an adaptation of William Shakespeare's King Lear that you think it is. Uh, directed by Jean-Luc Godard, it's an adaptation set in the avant-garde style of French New Way cinema, where it's not a typical cinematic adaptation of, the tra of Shakespeare's tragedy. Uh, you have a story set around uh, Switzerland, in and around Switzerland, where Godard went to primary school, while many of Godard's films are concerned with the invisible aspects of cinematography, the outward action of the film is centered on William Shakespeare, Jr. V, who is attempting to restore his ancestors' play in a world where most of human civilization, and mostly specifically culture, has been lost after the Chernobyl catastrophe. So yeah, they bring in Chernobyl into this. And um, yeah, it's a canon films movie, and yet... It has one of the. It has a ca a pretty impressive cast to it. I mean, like uh, Molly Ringwald's in here, Woody Allen, uh, Peter Sellars, not Peter Sellers, Norman Mailer as King Lear, Julie Delpy. I mean, this has a stacked cast to it, and yeah, you know, this is canon films back when they were trying to show that hey, we're not just a tip. We're not just a studio that makes schlocky mockbuster action blockbuster movies movies, cheap blockbuster films, but no, they were saying that this is a film that is just going to be, uh, Burgess Meredith is another name I forgot to mention here, but this is a film that shows that we are more than just that type of a company, and yeah, this thing bombed pretty hard too, and it, it cost a million dollars and only bought back $61,000, I and mean, that's, that's pretty bad in general, but um, let me see what the reviews for this were like, um, didn't get like bad, bad reviews, it got like mostly mixed reviews in general, um, but, uh, yeah, n again, not really much more I can say about this one, but it um, seems like an interesting concept in general, a Jean-Luc Godard French New Wave cinema version that brings in Chernobyl. Very, very interesting situation here, and I don't know if it works out because I haven't seen it, so um, that's King Lear for you. Are you glad I finally got to this one? Because I sure am not. Um, that was not a good week for movies in general, but next time we'll have January 15th to look at with four films, including uh, Four Keeps, Return of the Living Dead 2, we have the comedy Dan Aykroyd, uh, Walter Matthau, and Don Dixon in The Couch Trip, and Burt Reynolds and Liza Minnelli in Rent-A-Cop, so even if the movies aren't that great, they'll be at least more interesting to talk about than the films we had to deal with this week, so... Um yeah, uh, that's going to do it for this episode of Time About the Movie Slashback. Uh, thank you so much for watching, and I'm sorry. If you want to see more, much better videos than this, uh, please hit the playlist on the next page to check out the previous episode. Also, don't forget to hit the like and subscribe button if you want to see more videos, not like this, but other episodes of the show on this channel. So with that said, I'm off. I apologize again. This was not a very good week to talk about these movies. So um, anyway, we'll see you next time. And until then, as always, take care. In the Shakespearean play, King Lear, King Lear had three of them. Goneril, uh, Cordelia, and Regan. Who were they? King Lear had Goneril? <laughs>